What is up, y'all? Welcome back to another Fish the Moment live stream. This week, Randy and I are going to be breaking down the differences between two very popular baits the guys throw at the exact same time of the year. We have the jerk bait, we have the Alabama rig. Which one works better? When should you throw which one? Uh, the scenarios, weather conditions, lake types, all those things. We're going to dive into it all in this live stream and explain when you should be throwing a jerk bait versus an Alabama rig, or if you should just be throwing one all the time. Randy, how's it going tonight? Doing good, Johnny. Just got back from Lake the Ozarks. I went up there today and uh, did a little bit of filming, and I uh, just got back a little bit ago. Man, what a beautiful day here. It was like, man, it was probably close to 70, no wind. It was just felt like it was April out there today. Yeah, the weather's been crazy. It's supposed to be like 80 degrees here tomorrow, and like, 25 mile an hour winds and then after that it looks like it's going to be in the 40s and 30s for the next week so glad yeah. you got to enjoy that weather and uh you know we're going to be talking about the alabama rig and the jerk bait which is perfect for these colder conditions so if you guys are getting you know water temperatures getting down to the high 40s uh maybe low 50s that's when the alabama rig and that jerk bait really start to shine so we're getting into the season we're a little bit delayed here in uh, the ozarks but hopefully pretty soon we'll be getting into those good conditions yeah, I've been hearing just on my on my uh, social media that a lot of guys are catching them right now on Alabama rigs. In fact, mm -hmm. I'm hearing more about the Alabama rig than I am a jerk bait at this point. Water temperature still not quite cold enough, but um, everybody's already catching them on the A rigs. That's but I, A rigs and live scoping, they're all out there doing it. Yeah, your two favorite topics in the whole world, air rigs and live scopes. You're going to get some Randy rants tonight, guys. If you're here to hear Randy do a little bit of ranting, you are in luck today. Uh, but before we get into all of that, guys, we have to give a shout out to our sponsors. Uh, first up, we have Bridgeford Foods. I know some guys are giving me grief because the camera is flipped. The way that Randy and I communicate here uh, with the chat the screens are flipped and there's no way for me to change that. So apologize if that annoys you guys, but uh, Bridgeford Foods is a great sponsor of the Fish the Moment live stream. And every single week we do a giveaway for 12 cases of Bridgeford beef jerky, which is awesome. Huge shout out to Bridgeford. And we have the winner here. I'm going to announce it here in just a second. It, my phone got closed, but I'll announce the winner here in about five minutes of that um, beer, beef jerky giveaway. But if you guys are looking for a snack to take out in the lake, something that's easy, portable, that stays fresh in the glove box of the boat. Bridge for Beef Jerky is a great snack to take, high in protein, and it's just a really uh, satisfying snack when you're out there trying to chase after some fish. I put it in my pocket sometimes when I'm graphing or when I'm up on the front of the trolling motor looking at live scope. I don't know when Randy would eat because he's always casting and not graphing, but I'm sure he finds some time too. And so, uh, yeah, if you guys want to help support a company that supports bass fishing and supports this channel, check out Bridgeford Foods at your local uh, Walmart or at your lo local gas stations. The other sponsor for the Fish Moment Podcast is The Bass Tank. The Bass Tank is based out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they're the premier bass fishing electronics installation and retailer in the country. Let me pull up their website really quick, thebasstank.com, and show you a really cool deal they have going on. If you go to thebasstank.com, then go to their holiday sales, you're going to see a really great bundle deal for a, nine, a 93 SV Garmin unit with a live scope transducer for $2,199. That is an absolutely great deal if you're in the market for live scope. I've used this system before on several guys' boats. That 9 inch screen, really nice. You get a great clear picture. And if you already have Hummingbird units or Lowrance units, things like that, on your boat and you want to get a live scope or forward facing sonar. This is a great way to just add a fish finder up there exclusively for that live scope. And it's getting to be that season. It's already here. And if you don't have that live scope, you're missing out on some really good offshore bites, some suspended fish in deep timber, brush piles, stuff like that. So definitely check them out at thebasstank.com for this great deal. Or if you just need any other bass fishing electronics installed in your boat. They've rigged up my boat to be this Frankenstein rig with wires going everywhere and they give me dedicated power lines everything they hook me up with lithium batteries so i can run everything in my 18 foot triton i guarantee you if they can rig up as many wires and stuff in my 18 foot triton they can literally rig any boat because 
my boat is so full. I don't think they could fit any more wires or stuff on my boat. And they get it done though, and it's nice and clean and easy. And I can even get in there when I want to switch out transducers or change out things. I can uh, find my way through there because they keep it really nice and organized and clean. So definitely check out the Bass Tank if you want some help with your electronics, whether they were installed improperly or you're just looking to get a fish finder installed for the first time. Again, they're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you can check them out at thebasstank.com. Good deal, Randy. So let's jump into the main topic here. Oh, wait, before we get there, I want to, you to tell us about that story you heard over on Bass Blaster about the giant limit of smallmouth. Yeah, you know, I was really excited about that until I read the article about how they were caught on live scope, of course. But some dude caught a 36.30 pound bag of smallmouth for five. That's over a seven pound average of smallmouth. And uh, caught him up somewhere in northern Wisconsin a couple days ago on Mega Bass Spark Shad, live scoping them all. So it's like catching them one, on one rock out in the middle of nowhere, live scoping, 36 pound bag of smallmouth. Randy, so, how does that make you feel? The, the whole I, live You know, <laughs> it's like the, those are just, those are, that's 36 pounds of smallmouth that would not have been caught without live scope. I can promise you that. I'm, I mean, if that dude would have caught him, like, you know, throwing a jerk bait or, you know, burning a spinner bait or something. I'd have really been, you know, excited about it. But when I already caught him on live scope, it's just like, man, that doesn't really count in my opinion. Oh, <laughs> man. That much. He did catch him on that Mega Bass Spark Shed, though. So, hey, at least yeah. there's something going on there, uh, something yeah. that you're familiar with. That Spark Shad is a killer for smallmouth and clear water. Those, there's something about those northern smallmouth that really like that bait a lot. Hey, they catch big largemouth and – Big uh, spotted bass as well down here, down south and smallmouth. Yeah, that spark shed. I'll be talking about it on my Alabama rig and just other stuff. But I, you guys know, I kind of go strictly to spark shads and uh, the mega bass swim baits just because everyone around here throws Kai Tech. I think the fish got tired of Kai Tech after literally every company in the world ripped it off, and now it's like the most most available swim bait on the market for sure. And that spark shad is just something a little bit different. You can't pick it up in every single tackle shop, which I think is really useful, really helpful, um, just because it does. The fish don't see it as often. That's the reason I go to it. Yeah, it's the uh, the Kitech rib body swim bait. It's it's one. There's about a half a dozen baits out there that the fish have just gotten absolutely hammered by, and that it's like the Kitech swim bait, the Whopper Plopper. You know, Alabama rig to some extent. I mean, there there's certain baits out there that everyone's throwing. And uh, that's why I think that, you know, if you can get away from the profile of the rib body swim bait, I do think you get a lot more, a lot more bites on it, for sure. For sure. Especially in the clear water. Yep. Good deal. Awesome. Well, uh, one thing I did want to do is announce the winner of our Bridgeford Beef Jerky Giveaway, my phone was messed up, but now I got the winner here. The winner last week, we asked you, what was your favorite saying about bass fishing? And we went through some of the common sayings and kind of uh, debunked some of them or changed them up. And if you missed that in last week's live stream or podcast, check it out. Uh, you can find it on our Fish Moment Live YouTube channel here or on the Spotify or Apple podcast app. You can actually listen to this after we record it on the Spotify and Apple podcast apps while you're driving to the lake, going in your boat, stuff like that. So definitely check that out. It's the Fish the Moment podcast. So the winner for this week's Bridgeford Beef Jerky giveaway is Gordon Bevins. Gordon had a great comment. He said his favorite saying is, you can't catch another man's fish. That is one co common saying that a lot of guys have probably heard before, and it is one of the most true statements about bass fishing I have found. It is so hard to catch another angler's fish. Someone can tell you exactly where they caught them and the bait they caught them on and where they put their boat and all this stuff, but a lot of times it comes down to their casting angle, their, with the way they retrieve the bait, the confidence you even have in your bait, or your willingness to sit on the spot and fish it during the right conditions. There's so many factors that go into it, and you can just you know, be told, hey, go fish here, and maybe not catch anything. And one great story I have about that, Randy, is I actually fished a college fishing regional championship, and I was catching fish on this offshore spot, and I actually finished second in a local tournament the weekend before against all the locals, and I finished second by myself in a team tournament. So two guys were in the other boat, and one of the guys saw me, and he told his little brother about the spot, the night that, that I caught him on because he saw me fishing the other week before. And that guy was on my spot 
the day of the tournament, first thing in the morning, he was right on my fish. And the problem was he didn't know how to catch him. He didn't know the little sweet spot, the little shell bed I had found. And he was there for four hours, never caught a single fish. I then pulled in next to him four hours later because I knew that the fish only bit when the current was flowing and they had to be on that one little shell bed that was the size of the front deck of my boat. I pull in there like literally 20 feet away from a most bumping boats, get right on my lineup, cast that shell bed, catch 19 pounds off the spot and win the tournament and he actually zeroed that day. So <laughs> it doesn't pay to steal other people's spots. It doesn't pay to get information a lot of times. Finding your own fish, figuring out yourself will make you a better angler and will make you more consistent. I'm sure you can agree with that too. A hundred percent, man. That's, uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, a lot of people have to learn the hard way on that. Everybody, you know, they, they're so eager to become successful that they take, they want to take shortcuts around there. But I can promise you, I've had, I've had over 30 years, I've had so many people, you know, with good intentions offer me information and it just never works for me. It's just like I have never been able to just like, you know, the winner said, catch somebody else's fish. Everybody had because usually you're fishing something in the past. You're fishing something that was working yesterday instead of today's conditions. For sure. For sure. So huge shout out to Gordon Bevins for the great comments. If you email us, Gordon, at info at fishthemoment.com with your mailing address, we'll have Bridgeford send you 12 packages of Bridgeford beef jerky completely free. Again, just info at fishthemoment.com. Send us an email and we'll get that over to you. We'll announce another topic for tonight's giveaway halfway through the stream, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so Randy, the live, the um, jerkbait versus the Alabama rig. Let's get into it. Let's talk about this. We're going to get into how we rig our Alabama rigs. I have like four different ones I've rigged up. My desk is a mess. So if you see me fumbling around, I have like 16 different jerk baits and Alabama rigs, and they all get tangled together, you can imagine. One of the downsides of the Alabama rig. But Randy, just kind of give me a high-level overview of your opinion of the jerk bait versus the Alabama rig. What are the differences? Why is one better than another, or are, is one better than another? And just kind of your opinion. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is, you know, there's a lot of times when they work hand in hand when, and, and most of the time, if there's an A-rig bite, there's some type of a jerk bait bite on the lake. Sometimes one can be better than the other, but usually when those fish are setting up where they're starting to, to suspend a little bit shallower, like they do in early and late winter and all, even sometimes all through the winter, that is just the baits you can target with both of those baits. For me, here's the sort of the rule of thumb with it. It's. I have found that an Alabama rig and a jerk bait are very weather dependent, and there's a lot of different situations and variables to it. It has to do with the the sunlight intensity, the water clarity, how deep you're fishing, the rock composition and angle of the bank. There's a lot of stuff to it. But the the here's a good foundational as far as just a, a rule of thumb to build a base on. The time that I pick up an Alabama rig is normally when I feel the fish are a little bit more aggressive. And this can be like, it's usually, you have a south wind, you usually have some type of a light to moderate wind or even heavy wind too. And some type of a, at least partly cloudy, I prefer overcast. So when I've got those conditions, uh, it doesn't matter what time of winter, although I feel that at Alabama works better early in the winter or late in the winter when that water temperature is falling out of the 50s and when the water temperature is rising into the 50s early and late winter, if I get those conditions where it's sort of low light, it's a little bit nasty, that's when I pick up the Alabama rig every time. It seems like those more aggressive fish and the bigger aggressive fish will hit it. On the opposite end, the jerk bait for me is more of a consistent producer than an Alabama rig. It seems like the fish have got to be in a certain mood or a certain personality to bite an Alabama rig. All the, the most of the experience, the days I've had with Alabama rig, they're either on it really good or you can't buy a bite on it. Hmm. So the, to me, the jerk bait is more consistent day in and day out, especially if you lose your wind. Alabama rig is very, very light level and wind dependent. So you can catch them on an Alabama rig early in the morning with no wind under light conditions and then it gets tougher if the wind's not blowing and it's brighter, while the jerk bait gives you the option to adjust your color on the jerk bait to match the light intensity and the water clarity. If you have one of those days that's 
bright sunny and it's clear water and uh you know the fishing is a little bit tough you can go to a smaller jerk bait or a translucent model something like that and you can continue to catch fish that you would never get catch on that alabama rig so you know and we'll get into a lot more details on each one of them here in a little bit as far as baits and retrieves and how to throw them but the basic foundation guys is i go with alabama rig when i feel the fish are more aggressive and when I'm targeting bigger fish and the jerk bait under the tougher conditions where I want more numbers. I completely agree with that, Randy. And really what I find is the Alabama rig, a lot of times for me, especially shallower, is wind dependent. If there's more wind and darker skies, the Alabama rig is going to work a lot better. If you have bright skies and less wind, the jerk bait works better. That's just a general rule of thumb for me. I also find that in dirtier water, the Alabama rig in general will outperform a jerk bait because it has a bigger presence. It has a flash to it, but it will still draw those suspended bass. So if you have water visibility, especially in the winter time where you have less than two foot of visibility, the Alabama rig is going to outproduce that jerk bait normally two to one, regardless of the weather conditions, just because you can fish it a little more efficiently and it draws those fish in a little bit more. You can still catch fish on jerk baits down to a foot of water visibility at times, but the jerk bait's more of a sight feeding bait. And the Alabama rig, depending on which one you have, sometimes you can have a lot of blades on it, like this one where I have eight blades on there and a whole contraption uh, on there. The more blades you can put on there, the more vibration it gives off and the more it will draw those fish in. So there's a lot of different variations to this rig depending on what you're going for. Uh, and we'll get into all of that. But yeah, I definitely think that's a good general rule of thumb. Now, one thing I want to get into a little bit is the areas as well. Because you guys know I love talking to areas, not just the baits. And one thing that I've done a lot, Randy, is catch fish offshore on an Alabama rig. And I think that that's still one of those techniques that is underutilized. And honestly, I've got to the point now that I have the live scope, I don't throw the Alabama rig with the live scope because it feels like cheating. Because you can catch... An insane number of big fish with an Alabama rig in deep water if you have a live scope. I did it one time with you in September on Grand Lake when it's not it's not a time of year to throw an Alabama rig usually. And I hammered them out of like 40 feet of water on Grand Lake in September. That's the last time I've done it because it literally felt like cheating. I'd rather, if I'm going to throw the live scope, I throw a single swim bait. Um, that's it. If I don't have a live scope, then I'll go to the Alabama rig because I feel like it gives me a little bit more of a, ch a fighting chance. But I will not pair up the Alabama rig and the live scope. It, do it That does not seem sporting to me. That's where I draw my line, unfortunately. But well, yeah. uh, go, yeah. go ahead. Uh, yeah, I agree completely with that. You know, it's just a lot. It's, uh, we've, we've been over that over and over again. I, you know, it's, it's, you made a good point on that. It's like, you know, when you can find them on a live scope, if you can get an Alabama rig to those live scope fish, there's something about it. That is the number one bait. I, I got, I saw, I got waxed at the Toyota series tournament at uh, uh, Lake of the Ozarks this past March doing that. There was a dude fishing, you know, probably 50 feet away from me. And he was just making little pitches with, I was basically, I was throwing a jerk bait over the shallow flat that had scattered stumps on it fan casting everywhere and he was just making short casts with that Alabama rig to, to individual fish that he could see swimming over the flat. I mean, those were the same fish that I was catching. And a couple times he said, Oh, there's one swimming over to you right now. He's about 30 foot in front of your boat. I'm not going to mess with him because he's only a two pounder. So he just let me swim all past it. So it's oh, like, man. really dude, is that fishing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let me show you kind of some areas guys. I catch fish offshore on these baits and also up shallow and Randy, you can kind of uh, attest to some of these shallower spots as well but a very typical couple areas this is just lake de gray over in arkansas uh, a couple typical shallower water jerk bait areas that you're going to find in alabama rig areas you're going to find fish on in the winter time first up are going to be some of these kind of rounded points off of islands that are somewhat slow tapering um, you can put your boat out here over deeper water cast up to the shore and work your bait back somewhat offshore somewhat shallow you can also find them on some of these steeper channel swing points um, you know they can sit up here depending on the time of the year usually more in the middle of the winter when the water temperatures in the 40s they'll be more on these steeper channel swing points setting up in 10 to 15 feet of water even up against the bank and sometimes out off the point or they might be against some of these steeper, bluffy walls as well, especially when you get into those really cold conditions. I also find that if you have dirtier water, two foot of visibility or less, 
the steeper, bluffier banks will generate more Alabama rig bites in that cold, colder water. But as you water warms up into the you know 50s, high 40s, you can still catch them on those shallower channel swing points, stuff like that. These are kind of my key jerkbait areas up shallow. And would you kind of agree with that, Randy, on in premise? Yeah, definitely. I mean, anytime you got a channel swing in the cold weather, that's a key piece of cover um, in a lot of different water uh, water visibilities. And, you know, when you're talking about areas, whether it be shallow water or deep water areas in the wintertime, there are so many variables involved to it. I mean, because every single lake has a unique characteristic to the rock composition, the rock angle, the species of fish, the water clarity, the current in it. There's just so many variables that, you know, when we're talking about fishing a rig or jerk bait, like in the part of the country where Johnny and I live versus like fishing an a rig or a jerk bait on the, some of the TVA lakes, uh, it's just a different world. So, you know, maybe we can cover a little bit of everything on that and sort of get you guys clued in on what to look for on your particular region. For sure. And you can throw an a rig guys everywhere. I think that's one thing that surprises guys a lot. Um, They think that an A-rig needs to be a bait that you throw up um, on rocky banks or maybe on riprap or bridges and stuff like that. But I've caught fish guys in Alabama rigs out of grass. I've caught them in three foot of water, Randy, in lily pad stems on an Alabama rig when you're in Lake Dardanelle. So you can catch them. I've tried to recreate that video and I've not been able to do it. But there was one crazy year where I was catching them on Alabama rig in three foot of water where you throw a spinner bait and lily pad stems hammering them. Guy caught a 28 pound bag and a nine pounder on Dardanelle doing oh, that. Man. I had 23 pounds on it in one tournament, uh, Alabama rig and three feet of water. Uh, so they'll bite it uh, pretty much everywhere, but, uh, you can catch them on like shallow laydowns and stuff. So the Alabama rig really, you can, if you set it up right, you can throw it everywhere you want. Um, but you know, with the lakes that were Randy and I fish, I'm actually going to pull up Google earth here now, just to give you an idea of, you know, when you're fishing up shallow, to give you another example of what banks and stuff we're looking for, we're, you know, we might be going to more of the steeper chunk rock banks or where you maybe have like a rock transition, stuff like that. That could be an area where you catch them down the bank. A uh, couple of great places to catch them in the winter time is if you have standing timber in your lake, finding areas where you have standing trees. You can kind of see them here. Um, there's others down these banks. If you can find an outside row of standing timber, especially if there's areas where there's little cuts with timber in the middle of them, little channels and stuff, you can throw the Alabama rig through that timber, over the top of the timber, and absolutely hammer them. You can also throw them over the top of brush piles, or you can catch them just suspended out in the middle of the creek when they're chasing bait fish. And sometimes the bait fish are in the tops of tr- standing timber. Sometimes they're just out there randomly in the middle and you can kind of chase them around with the Alabama rig that way. And I've done that for years, Randy, before the live scope. And what I find is that actually in the past, I would follow those fish in the middle of those creeks and drains and guts with my 2D sonar and my down imaging, side imaging. And the way that I would get those fish to bite consistently is by throwing the A-rig. I had to throw the A-rig to get those fish to commit because they'll come from a further distance. And that used to be one of my little secret tricks that I would do in the wintertime. Now though, with the live scope, you can be a lot more precise and you can catch them on baits like a little swim bait. Before the live scope, if you wanted to go out in the middle of those creeks, and throw a swim baited fish, it was really hard. You basically had to get right on top of them vertically, or you had to get really lucky with your casts. But that Alabama rig would draw those fish from further distances. But, you know, you can throw the Alabama rig in a lot of scenarios, but really around that deep standing timber offshore, that is just absolutely a deadly technique. At the same time, you can also catch them on a jerk bait in Alabama rig on lakes like Lake Dardanelle, where you have really dirty water. And the trick with it is you do want to find areas where you have a little bit clear water, not the super, super dirty water, but where you maybe have like a foot, foot and a half, two foot of visibility. And you can just get on areas where you have this area here just has rocky bluffs on it. Rocky bluffs off the main rivers, um, especially on those TVA lakes. If you have bluff walls, you can catch them there. Or if you get into some of these backwaters, a lot of these offshore points, main points and stuff will have brush in front of them or have offshore grass. You can catch them in front of those areas as well. So if you have really d- dirty water, you can still catch them, but there's a cutoff. I see over here, there's a question from uh, BK. He says, chocolate milk, muddy water, very high muddy water. 
If you have high muddy water, a jerkbait in Alabama rig are not the baits for you. You need some sort of visibility to, for those fish to see your bait. In those situations, you're better off with a big Colorado bladed spinner bait or a big flipping jig. And just fish flooded cover with those baits. Big spinner bait, big jig, that's going to be your best bet. Alabama rig and a jerk bait, you need at least like a foot and a half to two foot of visibility to make them more viable, put it that way. Would you agree with that, Randy? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, you are not going to get many bites in cold water. If you have water visibility of less than 18 inches uh, on anything other than, like you said, a spinner bait or a jig or maybe some type of a big slow moving crankbait like that. So um, I have caught them on an Alabama rig in wintertime in that sort of that foot and a half, you know, maybe two foot visibility before. So that, especially if you got spinners on it, you know, that's, you can catch them on that, but mm -hmm. that's a little marginal for the jerk bait on there. For sure. So that's a little bit on the areas, a little bit on the baits. You know, we didn't go super deep into it. I'll be making more videos about this guys on the main Vision Moment channel. If you want more of a deep dive on like where and how and all that stuff, I'll make, I'll make an A-rig video that'll explain all of this um, with, with the locations and stuff a little bit more. But Let's jump in a little bit to the actual baits themselves, Randy. And I'm going to kind of run through some of my baits, but I know you have some Alabama rigs and stuff as well. So how about we start with your setups of how you set up your Alabama rigs versus you set up your, you know, your jerk baits. Maybe people know how you set up your jerk baits we talked about before, but maybe kind of just like explain more of your Alabama rig setup for us. Okay. Well, I'm going to start out, guys. I'm going to show you. I just had, had a chance to grab these real quick. I'm going to start out with the Alabama rig that I, that I use here. First of all, Let's do a little brief history of the Alabama rig. When it first, when Paul Elias first uh, won that FLW tournament on it, I was at that tournament he won. He had this big honking Alabama rig. I mean, this thing had arms on it like 12 inches long, and he was using like the big five and six inch, the paddle tails, the big giant swim baits. And that's, that's what people started fishing with when they first had the Alabama rig was these big giant Alabama rigs with the big swim baits. And the, the fish got conditioned to that really, really quick over a course of just like six months. And as a result, you started seeing people downsize their Alabama rig sizes and their swim bait sizes. And that's why that um, Flash Mob Jr. He, is that Booyah? It makes that Johnny, the Flash Mob? Yeah, the Booyah Flash Mob. Yeah, that Flash Mob Jr. became sort of like the dominating Alabama rig because it was quite a bit smaller than the big one. For me, when I'm fishing the Alabama rig anymore, this is the this is the go-to setup. This is a little finesse. This is the Mega Bass Spark rig, and this thing you can see how here's a, a jerk bait next to it. You can see how small this thing is. It's only about you know four or five inches long, and this particular one like this, it's like even though it's a small diminutive bait, I still catch big fish on it. It gives the fish a completely different look than like a full size Alabama rig. And then again, I use most of the time I'll use the three inch mega bass spark shadow on it. I just grab this out of the ones Johnny's using there. Um, sometimes I'll use the Kai Tech. It just depends on that. Sometimes I'll mix it up. I'll put like two spark shads and two Kai Techs on there to give it a different look. But the thing that I like about a small Alabama rig like this is I can throw it on my flipping stick really easy and I fish it like on 17 to 20 pound test four carbon line. So it's a, a little bit lighter setup. Most of the time I've got um, four eighth ounce heads on it, which, you know, the, the eighth ounce heads on a bait this size allows me to fish it in a lot of different depth zones pretty effectively. And the thing I like about it is I can fish this bait in shallow water, like less than five foot of water. I can throw it next to docks <clears throat> around lay downs. I can throw it, you know, if I want to fish it out on deeper points, anything like that. It's just been a really good producer for me. Um, in the era of you know the bigger alabama rigs that a lot of people throw another thing guys is i don't i mean i i use alabama rigs that have spinners on them but the the best days that i have had on alabama rigs have come on the ones that do not have spinners on it like the spark rig here and that's i guess it's because it's a little bit more subtle a little bit less obtrusive with it but i've caught some really big bags of fish on table rock lake Lake of the Ozarks um, on this particular setup right here. Um, so that is my favorite one by far. I mean, anymore, I've got a box of them, but anymore, I just do not use the big ones out there, hardly at all anymore. And it's interesting, Randy, because you fish mainly up shallow when you're 
throwing your Alabama rig or you know closer to the bank. Where I fish a lot more offshore with my Alabama rigs, I can I fish Alabama rigs down to forty feet of water, and I've actually found that for me personally, I get bigger bites when I throw the Alabama rig with the blades on it. And my this is the KC Schoolum Alabama rig, and here in Arkansas, we don't have any restrictions on how many blades or arms or or baits or anything like that. Um, and I have a rig here that I throw when I'm in Table Rock Lake in Missouri. I'll explain. It has some teasers on it. But um, my go-to is this Casey School. I actually have one that is made by a local guy, but I don't talk about it because you guys can't buy them. So um, they're, they're a locally made one, and I'd like to show you guys baits you can use. But the one that my buddy um, makes is an eight-arm Alabama rig. This is five arms. His has eight arms. There's also three blades per arm. So it's an absolute monster, but it will absolutely hammer him if you throw that, you know, as many blades, as many arms as you can. And the reason for that is because basically the Alabama rig, the reason the Alabama rig is good is it imitates a school of bait fish. And in general, bass are going to become more aggressive when there's a school of bait fish for them to chase versus an individual bait. The reason for this is because if they're chasing an individual shad, they may get one meal out of it or that little shad might escape. However, if there's a big group of shad, there's more potential for them to actually eat one of those bait fish. There's a higher probability of actually catching one. And they may even get multiple shad if they get lucky. So a lot of times the Alabama rig, what it's doing is it's triggering the fish's instinct to feed because they see a school of bait fish. An inactive bass sitting by the side of a dock won't come out a lot of times to bite a single swim bait. He'll just let it swim by because it's not worth the effort. But if you throw an Alabama rig down the side of that dock, what you'll find is that it'll trigger that bass's feeding instinct to chase a school of shad and they'll come out and eat it a lot better. And that's why the Alabama was so effective when it first came out. Not as effective as it used to be, but it's still very effective, especially offshore. So this rig here is absolutely a monster. And what I do with my Alabama rig, this five wire, you know, eight blade umbrella rig, I rig it up kind of special. So what I do is since I'm throwing it offshore and I want to get it deeper and I also want to fish it around more cover like brush piles, usually rock piles, sanding timber, I start by throwing it with a shaky head jig head on the bottom three wires. So if you take the wires here, there's three of them here, one, two, three, so the middle wire and then the bottom two. They have these three sixteenths ounce shaky head jig heads. These are the most weedless jig heads you can get for an Alabama rig. They're the extra wide gap. They're basically for like a Magnum shaky head. But it's a 316 sound. I think it's like a Yum umbrella or a Yum a Magnum shaky head, 316 of an ounce. I put three of those on the bottom. That way they're heavier. They're 316 of an ounce and they'll sink. And these baits will hit or make contact with the cover first because they're heavier. These are 316 of an ounce. You don't really need to go super heavy. I've sometimes gone as heavy as a um, quarter ounce or even a three-eighths ounce. And it really depends on how deep I'm fishing. I have another rig I'll show you that I have it rigged a little bit heavier. This three-sixteenths ounce setup is really good when I'm fishing, you know, 10 to 15 feet of water offshore. And then what I'll do on these top hooks is I actually have these Zorro weedless swim bait hooks. There was, it's the if you go type up Zorro Z O R R O on Tackle Warehouse, I'll show you in a second. Basically, it's this weedless umbrella rig hook. It has this double weed guard, not the best weed guard, like it doesn't stop it completely, but it also has a little shaky head hook on it. And the reason I'm throwing this light wire shaky head hook is if it gets hung up in a tree or something, I can just pull it out. I use 25 pound Berkeley big game monofilament line for my A rigs, and I just put these eighth ounce weedless jig heads up here so that. They kind of stay weedless, but at the same time, these are bigger swim baits. The heavier swim baits are going to make contact first. On there, this is so much to explain, Randy. Sorry. Uh, uh, but this uh, right here basically is a um, Mega Bass Spark Shad 4-inch size. I like the 4-inch Mega Bass Spark Shads on there. And then up here, you have the 4-inch Mega Bass Hasdong Shads. These are a little bit skinnier, a little bit thinner, and... They are more translucent in color, and I just find that this rig works really well for me. I've hammered them on it, and I know some guys are joking here that it's uh, $35, and they would spend all day untangling. I, I completely agree, guys, but I'm telling you, it freaking works. It catches big ones, um, and I've seen – you think that rig is ridiculous? I've seen way more ridiculous rigs out there. Now, 
Sometimes I will go to a smaller rig. Here's another option. This is the Umbrella Flash Mob Junior that Randy mentioned. And on this one, this is kind of my more shallower rig. When those fish are offshore in maybe 8 to 12 feet of water, they're not as deep. And this just has little 8th ounce jig heads. There's some Mega Bass Okashira heads, and there's like a Jewel Ned Rig head. It's just whatever heads I had around. But 8th ounce jig heads with that weedless Zorro head in the middle. It's a quarter ounce size. I have a little 3 inch Mega Bass Spark Shad. And then that center one you can see is a white 4 inch Spark Shad that I dyed Sartreuse on the bottom. That little rig a lot of times is a little bit smaller. If I'm in clearer water and those fish are higher up in the water column, you know, 10 feet from the surface, this gets the job done. Now, if I'm in Missouri, the other rig that I have, and it's another rig, is this one, which is that same Casey Schoolum rig. But because in Missouri, you can only throw um, three hooks. You can't use five hooks. You get three hooks. I rig this rig up this way. The way I rigged it up is I have two teasers on here. These are little three-inch Oakish or a three inch Hasdong Mega Bass uh, swim baits, Hasdong swim baits, just three inch. And I put a little uh, screw lock on that hook. I just put a screw lock on, and it's just a way to put a teaser on there. It's just you can buy them. I don't know exactly what they're called, but little screw lock snaps. So there's no hook there. There's just two little tiny swim baits just to kind of have something there. I then bent the wires up on that Alabama rig so that they kind of stay up and out of the way. Then down here on the bottom, I have two of the weedless Zorro quarter ounce jig heads with the Hasadong shads. And then I have a five eighths ounce fish the moment offshore jig jig head. This is actually for my fish moment offshore jig. I took the skirt off of it. Five eighths ounce jig head, weedless. It's heavy and has a five inch Mega Bass Spark Shad on it. This thing is my like 25 to 30 foot rig. It has a 5 8 ounce head, some quarter ounce heads, then just these keepers. I can get this thing down into 25 or 30 foot of water and sanding timber and catch him on this no problem. So there's a bunch of options there, a lot of ways to throw it. One thing that you guys have probably um, been saying over in the comments is I don't like this or whatever. Um, <clears throat> it's so expensive, things like that. I completely agree, and you guys probably haven't seen me throw the Alabama rig in like three years on my channel because of that. These are rigs that I've had for a while. <clears throat> I used to throw them a lot when I fished tournaments. I don't fish tournaments anymore, so I don't throw this very much because I don't really like throwing it. It's not something I really enjoy doing that much. Um, if I can help it, especially because you guys don't really like me when I throw them. Uh, honestly, I don't mind throwing them that much. They're just kind of heavy and cumbersome. But... Those are all my Alabama rigs, Randy. What are your thoughts on all that? Is that information overload? Well, I, you know, that's one of the reasons I don't throw much anymore because looking at your Alabama rigs, it's like when you when you get one of those things hung up and you break it off, it is just, it's not only expensive, but it's a pain in the butt to have to re-rig another one. But there's a, there's a couple of deals I'll share with you guys as far as tips on Alabama rigs because here at Table Rock, there was a period about five years ago or so where there was a handful of guys – my buddies that were just ripping the big fish on it. I mean, they were, they were winning tournaments. It, it, in the past, it had only taken like 17, 18 pounds to win most tournaments during the prime time of the year at Table Rock. And some of these guys were winning tournaments with 27, 28 pounds on the Alabama rig. There's a couple of different things with that. First of all, they throw, they were throwing 65 pound test braided line. I don't like the way an Alabama rig feels on braided line, but what these guys were doing, like what Johnny was talking about earlier, is they were getting on some areas that had the standing timber. And let me show you. Let me share my screen here, Johnny. I'm show them real yep. quick here. What we're talking about. Um, and if you could do share that, share screen on the uh, the other window yeah. there. Okay, you got it? Yep, I got it. Now, if you're fishing a man-made impoundment in the wintertime, this is, from what I have seen and what from I've gathered by talking to all my buddies, this is the number one type of area to look for. See, this is Main Lake area. This is actually Beaver Lake right here. Let's zoom out a little bit. You can see it's on the lower end of the lake. There's a dam, dam right here. And they're getting in the clear water areas, and they're getting on these Main Lake channel swing bluff banks, like this right here with this where the main river channel hits this bluff. 
and there's submerged timber out here and the timber tops are in anywhere between 15 to 20 foot of water. So they would throw these big Alabama rigs out here on this, the tops of these standing timber and with the 65 and they get hung up all the time. This was, this was back then. A lot of these guys, they don't like using weedless hooks. I've talked to them. They like to use a wire hook, like a four op big wire hook. And with that 65 pound test line, they just bend the hooks out when they get hung up on there. But the big fish that all these guys catch on a lot of the man-made impoundments that have uh, bluffy type banks, especially timber is in the tops of these timber areas like this. This is, that's where the big ones live that time of year. Another thing that, um, stop sharing my screen now. Another big thing that, you know, that from I've gathered from the tips on them, a lot of it has to do with retrieve and we didn't really talk about the retrieve much in there, but the best days that I've had on an Alabama rig and the way that I fish it most of the time, probably 95% of the time, is I'm constantly shaking that rod tip. I never just throw it out there and just reel it in. I throw it out there, I'll, depending upon the wind and how deep I want to fish it, I'm usually pulling the bait, usually pretty much straight at it or at a 10 o'clock 10 o'clock, ten o'clock position, and I'm shaking it like that, and I'm letting it fall and pulling it up and reeling it a couple of times and shaking it and let it fall down. And that erratic action, I get so many more bites. And I, if I try to reel the Alabama rig just straight through the water, not ever do anything, I don't hardly ever get a bite. But if I, you know, try to keep it in that depth zone that I'm fishing, with that stop and go retrieve, it just generates so many more strikes for me with it. And uh, a lot of the speed that you fish it is dependent upon the depth that you're fishing and the weight of the jig heads. But for the most part, you know, I like to fish it at just some type of a slow or medium speed like that. And I'm really wanting to go, excuse me, go again. No, that was the juice, by the way, right there, guys. I just want to reiterate that because one thing I'll say, I struggled catching him on the A-Rig when it first came out. I was, I've been throwing it since, like, the day after Paul Elias, uh, you know, we saw that Lake Gunnersville tournament, all that stuff. Like the two or three days after, my buddies and I were finding ways to get them made and we were going to local tackle shops and we were putting them all together and we had some like, you know, because they were so expensive and hard to get back then. We we're like, we could make that thing and we would like co cobble them together and we were throwing them and, you know, I could catch a couple fish on it, but it wasn't that much better than anything else. And we went out one day and I learned what Randy just said about the irregular retrieve. Fire that thing out there and you just can't reel that thing straight back. You have to burn it and then stop it and let it fall. Or just do two quick turns of the reel handle and then slow it down. Then two quick turns of the reel handle and slow it down. Or pop it with your rod. Something. I went from barely catching anything in the Alabama rig to the point where it was stupid. Where you could catch 23 to 5 pounders a day on all those lakes down there in Arkansas. It was incredible how good it was. But you had to vary that retrieve. Because I think a lot of those fish were following that rig back to the boat. And they weren't sure exactly what it was, but they were still pretty aggressive on it. And by stopping it or killing it, they ate it. And now I'd say 95% of my bites in an Alabama rig come when it's either falling, uh, and I start right when I start reeling it, or when I stop and pause it. I don't hardly get any bites anymore on the A rig when I'm just reeling it straight in. And that, what you're talking there, Johnny, as far as the uh, speeding it up and slowing it down, that is the key thing right there. So, so what you're doing, guys, is you're, you're just reeling it steady like that, and all of a sudden you just just like go like that real fast and if you got a high speed retrieve reel like a seven to one or something like that when you reel it like that and you make a complete turn like super fast like that it causes that a rig just to go just like that just for maybe two or three inches and that to me is the the key thing as far as getting a bite on an alabama rig when the water's cold for sure yeah, and I, once one uh, guy asked how many doubles we have on the A rig. I had a lot more doubles when it first came out than when I than I do now. I think the last time I've doubled up on the A rig was actually like 2019 on Lake Dardanelle. I actually have it on video. I caught a double on it. I caught two three pounders on it on one cast. But when it first came out, I mean, I had some triples. I had a quad. I had a four one time, Randy. But one of them was a, uh, a white bass, and then three large mouth. Mm -hmm. um, but I've, the most I've ever caught on one rig is four out of five. I've never caught a five, uh, all five. I think I may have actually had five on at one point on the school of Kentucky's uh, on Lake Washita, but I think it came off. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I I was pretty sure that I saw one uh, come off. But yeah. you know, I've had some. Uh, some fours and five, or some four, four fish, some three fish, all that stuff. But I've never, 
Never had the all five largemouth. Have you? I know that the most I've ever caught just been two on them. But one of the things that I found out interesting on Alabama rig is like, you know, is which swim bait they hit because I tweak this a lot. It's like I found the best as far as I've I've tried different colors. I've tried different sizes on the same a rig. You know, I've tried putting a big one on the main, you know, longest uh, arm of the A rig. I've tried putting dies on certain ones of them. And I have not noticed a pattern really of them hitting one or the other. It's like, and I, and I got to the point where I just use basically four of the same size. I don't really go to any bigger ones like that because I, I caught just as many good fish on the three inch swim bait. If I had one four inch on there, it's, it's really uh, interesting with that. But, one thing about it, I have never done any good on an A rig that I, where I've had like four, or, or excuse me, all of the swim baits like being over four inches long. It's like I have caught way more fish and way more quality fish, like five pound class fish, on the three inch swim baits by far. And that that may just be the part of the country that I'm in because you know we're fishing the Ozarks here. All you guys that are fishing, you know, Rayburn with it, or if you're fishing. Chickamauga or Gunnersville or something like that. I mean, it's probably going to be the bigger ones are probably going to be a little bit better. For sure. Now, we've been talking to the A rig a lot. I know a lot of you guys don't like the A rig or they are kind of like, oh, what should I do when the A rig bite is on? And what I found, Randy, is that when the A rig bite is on, it's really hard to compete against the guys that are throwing the A rig. It's not impossible, though. If you're good with other types of baits, I would say that you could catch 85% of what the anglers are catching with the with other baits versus the Alabama rig. If someone's on the Alabama rig pattern and they're just hammering them, they're going to win the tournament. That's just the way it's going to go if the A rigs are allowed. But you can still catch the same fish they're biting the A rig if you're throwing the right bait in those areas. And really... The A rig is interesting because a lot of guys just say, oh, I got one A rig and I just throw it. For me, I have to have multiple A rigs. When I'm going out fishing and I know I'm going to catch my A rig, I'll usually have four different A rigs tied on, which seems ridiculous. And I used to have this happen all the time. But what I would do is I would have A rigs with all different size heads, with wires, with blades and without blades. I used to, I still have a lot of these that don't have blades. I've gone more to just blades. Just, I, I don't know, I haven't thrown the A-Rig that much recently. But like when I was like A-Rig aficionado, because back in, two, if you guys fished tournaments in 2013, 2014, in the wintertime, 2012, if you weren't throwing an A-Rig, you were losing every tournament. So there was like a three-year period from October through basically May that if you were not throwing an A-Rig, you were not competitive in tournaments, and you weren't going to have a chance to win. Everything was won in A-Rig. So I had to learn all the tricks, basically, with it. But I would have one with, like, 16-sounds heads and small swim baits. I'd have the A-Rigs with a lot of arms, a lot of blades, bigger heads, heavier heads, all kinds of stuff. And the goal with that was to try to, one, one, uh, try to find a rig that maybe would get bit in fishing pressure. So smaller baits might get more bites on certain days. Um, you know, a bigger Alabama rig might get bigger bites at times. Heavier heads work better in deeper water, lighter heads in shallower water. And so I still had to carry like four A rigs on the deck of the boat, but you can cover those same exact scenarios with other baits. And let me kind of show you what I mean with Navionics here. And this is just Blake to Gray, an area where I've caught a lot of fish on A rig over the years. Um, let's just say we're fishing this point right here. Let's say that those fish, for example, are pulled up right against this bank, and they're right up against this channel swing bank, and you can catch them just throwing the A-Rig down the bank, just a basic cast it to the bank and reel it in, which is a lot of times how you could catch them back then. In that scenario, you can catch those exact same fish on a regular jerkbait, a standard jerkbait, Mega Bass Vision 110, Pointer 100, don't need like a deep dive or anything, just a regular jerkbait, you can catch those fish. Usually you're going to catch more numbers a lot of times with the jerkbait versus the Alabama rig even, but the A-Rig will generate usually a better quality fish on average over the course of a day. So regular jerkbait will work. Let's say then you move out further off the point here, and you're maybe over 15, 20 feet of water, or maybe just on this edge of this channel right here. This is where I would go to a heavier Alabama rig with maybe quarter ounce heads, maybe a three eighths ounce head in the middle, and I'd be reeling it off the tip of this point more offshore, a little bit deeper, 
you can still catch those same fish because a lot of times those fish in 15 to 20 foot will be suspended seven, eight, nine feet down. And you can catch those fish on a deep diving jerk bait, like a Mega Bass Vision 1 10 plus 1, a Smithwick Perfect 10 Rogue. I'll show you guys these baits in a second. Just a little bit deeper diving jerk bait. Or if there's like a brush pile out here and those fish are suspended in that brush pile or over some timber, you can throw a deeper diving jerk bait. And then finally, if those fish are really deep, especially if you're kind of getting further out towards like main lake stuff, and let's say sometimes I would catch fish like in the center of these guts and drains and the tops of timber, even all the way back to like, I was doing this with my 2D sonar and down imaging years ago, but they'd be like center of these ditches and stuff. And you could throw the A-rig in those ditches and the tops of timber in 30, 40 feet of water. You can still catch those same fish on a single swim bait. You can throw a little Mega Bass Spark Shad 3 inch on a jig head or a bigger hollow body swim bait stuff like that and so you can catch those all those fish in the exact same scenarios and a lot of times you can catch just as many in numbers but the size may be just a little bit smaller on average is what i found and so basically my baits to compensate for the a-rig if i not throw on the a-rig are a regular diving jerk bait and the deeper diving jerk baits you have your Vision 110 plus one jerk baits, uh, your regular Vision 110s, Smithwick Perfect 10 Rogue, Vision 110 plus two. All these jerk baits will cover you down to about 15 feet of water from you know three foot of water to 15 feet of water. Then past 15 feet, that's when you go to your swim baits. You got your three inch Mega Bass Spark Shad. This will work all the way down to 50, 60 feet of water. And then if you want to go for a bigger bite, here's my secret weapon, Randy. It's the Mega Bass Mag Draft Freestyle Swim Bait on a one ounce underspin. This is, I mean, you can see actually on that bait, it is absolutely torn up by giant fish. I've caught them all over the place. You saw me catch them in one video on Lake Swepco uh, over here in Arkansas. I hammered them mm -hmm. on this thing. Big ones. That's a power plant lake. But I've caught them on Grand Lake. I've caught them all over the place on this uh, big swim bait. Down over in Texas, I've caught them on it. One ounce underspin. This thing will work where that A-Rig works as well. Down there, 25, 30 feet of water. And when you want a big bite, this thing will get a big bite. You're not going to get the numbers as, the, as much as the A-Rig, but that thing will get a big bite, the same quality as the A-Rig. So there are options out there that work. And personally, that's what I've gone to, especially since I got the live scope. I don't throw the A-Rig anymore, as I mentioned earlier, because I just... A-Rig plus Live Scope for me, that is too much. If I didn't have the Live Scope, I'd probably throw the A-Rig a little bit more than I do just because those suspended fish can be tricky to catch without the A-Rig. But if you have Live Scope, the suspended fish are a lot easier to catch. And at that point, I like to just go to a single hook, uh, swim bait or like a jerk bait, stuff like that. So uh, any thoughts on all that, Randy? Yeah, I think it's really up to your imagination on the A-Rig there because I can, I can remember we were fishing an FLW tournament at a – um, Smith, yeah, Smith Lake in Alabama, and Jacob Prosnick finished top five in that tournament. And I saw him fishing, and he was, he had just a regular Alabama rig, and he was just pitching it and flipping it around laydowns on the trees, just yep. just reeling that thing like you would, like you throw a spinner bait by a laydown. And it was just something those fish had never seen before. So, you know, it's just there's a lot of different ways that you can catch them. A lot of people equate the A-Rig to some type of a deeper water, main lake point, uh, you know, open water type technique, but it catches them in shallow water, just like you're talking about around the pads too. For sure. Um, and then someone's asking why I use uh, monofilament line on my A-Rigs. I just, I had some horror stories, Randy. Um, I used to throw braid, but I don't like braid in clear water. I know it doesn't matter because you're throwing a giant hunk of, Oh my gosh, they're all tangled together. This is nightmare, nightmare material. But it's a giant hunk of metal. I don't think the braid actually makes a difference. The reason I don't like the braid is because I didn't like the way, I didn't like the idea if I'm throwing around brush or timber that that braided line, you could they could hear it going over the tops of those trees. That was my thought in my head. They're hearing that. They probably hear it a little bit with the mono, but it, it slides over easier. That was my thinking on that. And it's just a mental thing. I've tried fluorocarbon. And I've thrown all different fluorocarbons. This was just something that happened to me a while back. I broke off like two Alabama rigs with 20 pound, 25 pound fluoro back in the day. And fluoro is also kind of expensive back in the day. So I was like, okay, I broke off a couple A rigs with the, with the fluoro. It may have just been bad line. I don't know what it was. So at that, that point, I just bought some Berkeley Big Game 25 pound test. 
and I've never broken off 25 pound Berkeley big game knock on wood ever. I think you can tow a, uh, rip the bumper off of a truck with 25 pound Berkeley big game. And if I get something hung, I am pulling it out. It doesn't matter. Um, so that's why I do that. I just throw my big game. And also I like the stretch of the mono, especially when I'm throwing these lighter wire hooks. If you're throwing heavy hooks, those big beefy hooks, then maybe having fluorocarbon or braid is better. I throw little uh, shaky head hooks on my Alabama rig just because I want to be able to bend them out. And I can bend them out just fine with the monofilament, but that little bit extra stretch on the mono, it will make it so that I don't rip those hooks out of the fish's mouth. If I have uh, little tiny hooks with braided line, it will rip those hooks out of the fish's mouth. I've had it happen before. So that's why I throw monofilament. Uh, just my yeah. personal preference. I know that the, the best, the two top Alabama rig fishermen on Table Rock Lake, you know, at clear water, you know, we got 8, 10, 12 foot of visibility in the wintertime here. They throw 65 pound braid in the clear water all the time. And it's just like, man, I just don't understand because it looks like rope in the water. I mean, when you got 65 pound braid in 10 foot of visibility, there's nothing subtle about it. And they just don't think it matters at all. But I'm the same way. I just, I think it's a little bit stealthier. I like the way it feels going through the rod guides as far as when you, when you're using it. And that's the same hang up I have with using braid to fluorocarbon on a spinning rod. I just don't, uh, it's, it's not going to get you any more bites is the thing about it with those guys that are using the 65 pound test it's not generating more strikes for them they just they feel for whatever reason they can be more efficient with it maybe you know when they get hung up or or whatever but um i've no, i have noticed a trend about a lot of people going away from that that used to use it all the time though for sure someone says is my beat up old rods hey those rods in 2012 were almost brand new. I want to tell you that, guys, because now those rods are 10 years old, but 10 years ago, they were pretty new. It's crazy to think, Randy, the a -Rig came out 10 years ago. I don't know. Now I feel like I'm getting old, and I know that I'm not. I know you've seen everything in fishing. Now I, I feel I, like it, I'm getting old. The a -Rig came out 10 years I'll ago. I'll tell you one of the, the proudest moments of my fishing career. We, we were fishing an FLW tournament at, at Beaver Lake. It was the one that Jason Christie won on the Alabama rig. And everybody was throwing an Alabama rig. It's like there wasn't the single person except me throwing, not throwing an Alabama rig. And it was, I got, at this time, I, I, I was getting the same attitude about the A rigs that I've got about live scopes and bed fishing. So I refused to throw it. So the first day of that tournament, I went out and caught 18 pounds on a wiggle wart and was in second place the first day of that tournament, knowing. I was the only one not fishing Alabama rig. That was probably the highlight of my tournament career as far as just being satisfying, knowing you didn't have to throw an Alabama rig. So here's the question everyone's here for. There's 230 people. I know they're waiting for me to ask this question, Randy. If you had to choose one to fish with for the rest of your life, you, you, had, you had to have one of these on the front deck of your boat every day you went fishing. You have to live with that shame forever. Every time you roll up to the boat launch, people see this in the front deck of your boat. Would you rather have a live scope on the front deck of your boat or an Alabama rig? Which one for you is worse to have up there? What what Which one would give you more shame? Oh, the worst would definitely be the live scope. You will, I will get my butt kicked every single tournament before I use one of those. At this point, I've got my heels dug in. If I go against, if I can you imagine if I showed up with a live scope on my bait, the... Uh, the, you know the the strife I would catch over that. So no, you'll never see me with a with a uh, live scope in the boat. All those guys on BassResource.com and uh, Bass Boat Central and Texas Fishing Forum that just they that they would go crazy. There would be posts. Don't worry, guys. We read all those comments, or at least I do, on those bass fishing boards. When you guys are roasting us over there, we see it. I just uh, I just tend to ignore it. But man. You got you got some some haters over there, Andy. But yeah, those those forums. All, you, some of you guys are probably over there. You know what I'm talking about. Those forums would be lighting it up. There'll be pictures, Randy block it uh, with the the final sin. Everyone cancel Randy. He's got the he's got the live scope. Randy's gone crazy. Yeah, oh, yeah. that would be crazy. Oh man. Yeah, I like I said, I just man, now I'm in a bad mood now after that guy caught 36 pounds of smallmouth off the live scope today. It's just oh, like, man. man. <laughs> one thing that, uh, 
one thing that I find with the the whole uh, Alabama rig thing, guys, is the reason I like throwing the Alabama rig from time to time, personally, is for me the joy in fishing comes from finding fish. If you haven't noticed that already, I'm not that big of a tackle junkie. I do a lot of. I mean, obviously, I have a lot of tackle. You need to have a lot of tackle to figure out ways to catch fish. But for me, the 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 thing that makes me enjoy fishing is finding fish. And so if I can find a school of five pounders and catch two of them and get them to bite, that makes me super happy. But really getting them to bite and everything is like the least satisfying part of the fishing process. I really just like knowing that I went out and found the fish. And that's probably why I'm not... Uh, uh, probably the most patient like tournament angler either because what I would do, Randy, is I would go in my tournaments and I'd find a school, I'd bust them, catch a bunch of fish and be like, okay, gotta go find the next school because I get my like my adrenaline rush, my dopamine rush when I find a school of fish and I catch a couple fish. After I catch like two or three fish, my excitement level drops like 95% and it feels just like, okay, why am I sitting here catching another three pounder? I know they're here. And the nice thing about the Alabama rig is a lot of times they'll bite the Alabama rig when they won't bite anything else and so if i see a group of fish down there in my electronics or whatever and i find them and i'm like oh there they are if i can get them to bite an a rig when they're biting nothing else i can at least tell myself oh i found some fish i know they're here i know what's going on and maybe i'll experiment to find a different bait that i could catch them on if that's not the a rig and that's kind of fun too but for me the excitement is always finding them uh whether it's with electronics not electronics doesn't really matter but i love finding fish that's what gets me excited about bass fishing and i know for you randy it's probably you really like the casting and the catching so it's we're on the opposite end of the spectrum there yeah i to me it's like um it, the whole process is gratifying it's like i i don't i don't think anyone likes to go out there and just fish all day and not catch, get any bites or anything but it's like it can change so quick. It's just like you can you can be fishing half a day and like it's like you just can't get anything going and you just like it's like man these fish aren't biting. It's like I'm not sure what to do. And then you make one little slight adjustment and it's like the light turns on and you can just run with it. That's the that's sort of one of my favorite things about fishing is when you finally do get on the fish and then you can really capitalize and maximize on an area or a pattern once you found it. So uh, that's what keeps us all coming back for it. If we caught them every time we went out, it would not be fun. You know, that's uh, that goes back to my opposition against live scope. You know, there's, you can't underestimate that mystery and the mystique behind fishing in general. For sure. Yeah. It's just, everyone has their own uh, enjoyment. I know Randy, you, you and I, have different ways that we enjoy fishing i think everyone enjoys fishing in a different way and my my opinion is just enjoy it the way that you you want to and uh as long as you're getting on the lake and fishing that's a big thing for me it's very therapeutic i enjoy it i haven't been fishing randy now for like three weeks and it's absolutely driving oh, yeah. me crazy all yeah. these guys are catching them offshore and deep timber and i've told people i'm gonna make a deep timber show and like they're right there they're hammering them and i can't fish because i'm making this app uh, and you guys have heard about the app if you saw the live stream a couple weeks ago. Um, we are making a lot of progress, and the reason that I'm not fishing is because I am on my computer. I have not left this chair since 7 a.m. this morning because I have just been working nonstop on this app uh, and getting it cleaned up and everything. So we are trying to get this out as fast as we can for you guys. I'll have more updates on it here soon. Uh, we're just validating everything, making sure everything is, is as clean as possible, and appreciate everyone who is in the beta uh, testing it all out. We are going to be continuing to grind on it and get it out as fast as possible. And once that's done, I can actually do some fishing. Um, so that's exciting. I'm like, I'm like, I'm itching now to just get back. I don't even care if I catch like one, two pounder or like a pound and a half fish all day. Like, I just want to get out there and set the hook on something. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, well, one thing really quick, Randy, I do want to, uh, before I forget, I do want to let everyone know about the uh, Bridgeford Beef Jerky giveaway for this week. If you guys want a chance to win 12 packs of Bridgeford Beef Jerky sent straight to your house, what you guys can do is leave a comment in the actual YouTube video, not here in the chat. I know a lot of guys are in the chat and the comments are not available right now, which is unfortunate. But once the, once the video is done and the live stream is over, leave a comment telling us your opinion about the Alabama rig. Do you like it? Do you hate it? What do you think? Is it the worst thing that ever happened? Do you think they should unban it in tournaments and let everyone throw it? What do you think? Uh, interested to hear your opinion on that, on the Alabama rig. And if you give us your opinion, I'll choose one uh, comment from the comment section 
next week to give them a free case of Bridgeford beef jerky sent straight to their house. Huge shout out to Bridgeford for sponsoring the Fish Moment live stream and also huge shout out to the Bass Tank, our other sponsor. Couldn't do this podcast and live stream weekly without them. Huge uh, shout out to all their support. Thanks to all the support you guys give us as well over on our website, fishmoment.com and also over on uh, Patreon for all my Patreon members. Really appreciate that. One thing I did want to throw out there really quick, guys, that I think is really cool is something that I didn't actually, I don't think we've talked about yet, but if you guys go to our website, fishthemoment.com, and go to our Lake Breakdowns page, we actually added some new Lake Breakdowns from Matt Steffen. If you guys don't know Matt, he is an amazing northern angler, uh, fishes up north, but hammers him here down south as well, fishes uh, the pro tours. And if you go to our website, fishthemoment.com, and go to the smallmouth, southern smallmouth breakdowns, Matt actually made some breakdowns, some winter maps on southern smallmouth fisheries. So if you guys fish Table Rock Lake, Lake Cumberland, Gross Ferry Lake, Beaver Lake, Lake Ten Killer in Oklahoma, Dale Hollow, Cherokee Lake in Tennessee, these breakdowns will give you 40 GPS waypoints, both shallow and deep, specifically for smallmouth. That's it. So if you guys want detailed area description, summaries of the lake, these waypoints you can transfer straight to your fish finder. On smallmouth specifically down south, these are what these breakdowns are for. I've been going through these, Randy, and I've learned so much about southern smallmouth fishing because Matt you know, catches them up north and he knows smallmouth behavior and he's translated down here down south and he is a hammer down here on these smallmouth lakes. So definitely check out these smallmouth lake breakdowns from Matt Steffen on fishmoment.com. And if you guys have ever wondered how to catch smallmouth, just want to go take a trip and figure it out, these smallmouth lake breakdowns are the way to do it. So definitely check those out. I actually have some offshore lake breakdowns coming too for winter patterns uh, coming out later this week. So check out as well. I don't have any up right now. I just have a few fall ones, but I have several coming out this next week. And Randy's always adding a ton of breakdowns to his list as well. So definitely check those out. His winter breakdowns are awesome. There's a ton of them available and you can also always check out his personal lake breakdowns if we don't have your lake already, which we have a lot of lakes, so uh, it seems like we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of them covered because we're not getting as many requests. So if you do have requests, we have some openings for sure. Good deal. Yeah, you know, I don't know many of you guys, how many of you guys know Matt Steffen out there, but Matt is, in my opinion, one of the top five smallmouth anglers in the United States. He's He is a genius when it comes to smallmouth. You hear about the guys like, uh, Chris and Corey Johnston, uh, Matt Stefan is every bit as good as any any of those guys. So, if if you guys want to get some really expert information, definitely check out Matt's smallmouth maps. And the stuff he's picking out, guys, like Matt is like a genius at these smallmouth stuff. And he's picking out really subtle stuff. Like that's how we all do our breakdowns and stuff like that. But like the stuff he's picking out are like things that I don't think about like subtle areas that I'm not thinking about for when I'm fishing a lot of largemouth. I focus a lot more on largemouth spotted bass uh, for my offshore breakdowns because that's kind of what I'm known for, what I catch most of my fish on. I do catch smallmouth at times, but I'm not targeting them specifically. And the little subtle things he's focusing on for the smallmouth versus largemouth is so interesting because I focus on very subtle, nuanced things for the largemouth and I try to really uh, pack my breakdowns with those and I spend a ton of time finding these little tiny spots the whole goal with these breakdowns is we want to give you guys spots that are good on lakes that are pressured and spots that aren't just going to be like the obvious community holes we're not just marking community holes for you guys we're marking stuff that's going to be places that we would fish if we were trying to beat the competition to actually catch fish so just putting that out there awesome so Randy final verdict on the Alabama rig I want to get your opinion Last but not least, should they unban the umbrella rig or the Alabama rig from tournament bass fishing competition? They banned it years ago, 2013, 2014. A lot of you guys feel like the Alabama rig is not as effective as it used to be. And also a lot of tournaments are not fished in seasons that the Alabama rig is super useful. With all that being said, do you think they could potentially unban it and let it back in to the fishing tournament world? Or do you think that it's just better ban, keep it on the shelf? What do you think? I, you know, right now it's like half the tournament circuits ban it and half the tournament circuits have it legal. I would like to see the thing banned from tournament competition. Maybe set it up where you can use it in practice, but where you cannot use it in tournament competition. I don't like the whole idea of, the, I mean, there's the conservation issue as far as 
a lot of the times when I catch them on Alabama rig, I got half of them are hooked in the side they're under their bellies and everything like that. That's one aspect of it. But two, you're always dealing with this multiple hook situation. You know, one hook, one rod, one reel, you know, that's just more of a sporting way to catch it. And I think that's what, you know, a lot of the purists like myself out there, we're trying to keep it a sporting, a, a sporting type of an event. And that's why I'm against things like the Alabama rig. I'm against bed fishing. I'm against live scopes because I think that all three of that type of stuff takes away from that, that purest sporting element a little bit. Yeah, not for me personally. I'm uh, I'm happy that they want the Alabama rig also because the thing for me is I hate that a whole tournament can get dominated on one bait. It's for me, it's kind of like it takes some of the fun out of it. If I was going to go fish tournaments, and when I was fishing tournaments, I got tired of okay, where am I going to go throw the Alabama rig this tournament? That's where it came down to. It wasn't can I throw a jig or anything else? It got to the point where I literally would just have four Alabama rigs in the deck of the boat and I never re-rig tackle. All I did was retie my A-rigs and change out hooks that got bent for like a year of, or like a whole season from, basically it was like six months of tournaments. I wouldn't have anything else on. Like I wouldn't even throw football jigs. I wouldn't throw anything because there's no point. I mean, if I didn't, if I threw anything else, it was literally a waste of time because yeah, I could catch one two pounder on something, but I'd rather throw the A rig for that hour and potentially catch a four or five pounder. So it's not as powerful as it used to be, but it definitely is still really effective. Um, and then if you add live scope into it, yeah, I, I think it's especially if live scope is there, live scope plus A rig, that is no bueno. I am not a fan of that. And also, how do you know the guys aren't going to be potentially? snagging fish on purpose because they can see them on the a rig they can see the fish they see it kind of coming in they set the hook on them they're like oh you know how do you how do you protect against that and i don't know how you protect against that now because i think that some guys may be just snagging them right now with the with the live scope too i mean i could see that happening so i that's not something that i've ever tried to do and that's something i I haven't even really talked about that's one concern i do have with the live scope for guys is how many people are just taking a jigging spoon with a two-aught hook and just ripping it through some fish and belly hooking them and bringing them up and there you go you got your fish um i guess you could do it with 2d sonar back in the day too but uh you know just some things to think about i don't know kind of crazy. yeah you know i have noticed a resurgence in the alabama rig since the advent of live scope i mean there was a period there before live scope got hot that you know was, it was sort of dying off a little bit you just didn't see or hear about it that much but now it's I, i'm reading more and more guys winning tournaments on it where it's, where it's allowed on their circuits, especially here regionally, like in, in Missouri. I mean, we have a lot of like regional circuits that, you know, all over these lakes here and most of them allow Alabama rigs and they're, they're a dominant player right now. They are. For sure. Yeah. And uh, there's a comment over here saying that finally Johnny sees the light. Um, yeah. The, the, the whole live scope thing, guys, like I like my live scope. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it because I can learn fish behavior from it. That's something I really enjoy about it. I can see how fish react. It's interesting to me. Um, it helps. I feel like it makes me a better fisherman just from a knowledge perspective of what's happening under the water. And even when I don't have live scope, I feel like I can understand what's going on there in my brain a little bit better. And I personally feel like if you took the live scope away, I wouldn't mind that because I, I learned to fish offshore without it. And a lot of the techniques that I use offshore are still very effective, but there are times when I have to use the live scope to catch them offshore because that's the best way to catch them. So it's kind of getting to that same point with the Alabama rig where it's like on Table Rock Lake right now, the way you're going to win a tournament most likely is going and fishing in deep timber and guts and stuff like that with a jigging spoon, a swim bait, stuff like that with the, with the live scope. But I know you can also catch a big bag of fish on a football jig on hard structure somewhere or f- fishing it through deep standing timber or stuff like that without live scope. And I used to be very, very, I mean, I'm still really good at doing that. That's one of my strengths. So it wouldn't necessarily break my heart if the live scope wasn't uh, allowed. But because it is and it's something that's available, I'm going to use it because it gives me the best chance to catch fish. That's think how a lot of you guys feel about it, Randy. I think it's yeah. more guys are more like I have to use it versus I love to use it. Yeah, I think that's a that's an attitude. Some some guys just love it. I mean, they think it's just the greatest thing in the world, and some guys do out of necessity. 
and then some guys like myself and and Bill there, you know, we just we, we just are totally against it. Yeah. Oh, uh, someone uh, asked what the, this app was. I'll show you guys here. You can actually check out our website on it. Uh, it's called Deep Dive. So you can go to deepdiveapp.com. We were doing a beta for it but it filled up within like three hours so we had to close the beta unfortunately so some of you guys actually have access to it but basically what it does is it allows you to put in a variety of conditions and then gives you a lot of conditions as well like your lake level current flow the uh, frontal conditions wind direction wind all that stuff and all of those things get calculated in this app using ai artificial intelligence whatever you want to call it and it will use all of these inputs to predict which pattern you should be fishing. So it starts out at the bait level, gives you strategies both shallow and deep, and these baits and patterns and everything adjust based on current conditions, whether it's your water clarity, water temperature, the current flow, wind direction, cloud cover, chance of rain, barometric pressure, all those things, water level, they all affect what's going on in here. And within that, we also give you detailed area recommendations of where to fish, what to look for on the bank with cover, uh, offshore structure, what to look like on your fish finder, um, equipment recommendations, all this stuff. And it really just kind of takes uh, a lot of the guesswork out of how to uh, make these adjustments um, to these current conditions. And it's not obviously foolproof. There is still a lot of uh, decision-making you have to make in there, but it gets a lot of anglers to a good starting point. The way I kind of think about this is I wanted to kind of flatten the learning curve a little bit for newer anglers where you didn't necessarily have to go and spend hundreds of hours on the water and watch hundreds of hours of YouTube videos to start having success fishing. There's so much more nuance that goes into bass fishing. And I feel like a lot of people will see the app and they're like, oh, it just does everything for you. No, it gets everyone to a good starting point. And then from there, you have a lot of the information that is just information overload managed for you to an extent. And then you can take that and really start developing skills, figure out which patterns work better on my lake. What patterns am I better at? How do I rotate spots? How long should I spend in a fishing spot? There's so much, so many other factors that go into being a good fisherman rather than just, you know, should I throw a crankbait or a jig right now? So that's kind of the idea. Or should I be on a steeper bank or a flatter bank, depending on the time of year? So that's what the app is designed for, and we're working on getting that out as fast as possible. Uh, again, everyone in the beta, hopefully you guys uh, are enjoying that, and we're going to get that out to you as fast as we can. Uh, what do you think about the app, Randy? I know you've uh, taken a spin with it a little bit. No, I definitely think anything like that that gives you access to information that you know you can utilize is a good thing. I mean, you, and the, the, the great thing about the app is it gives you, first of all, it gives you a solid foundation to begin with. You've got to have a foundation to begin your search somewhere, and then you can modify it from that. But if you're on a lake that you guys maybe don't know a lot about or a lake that you're getting ready to go to, and you, you need to get some type of, of mental picture of what it's like and some, some place to start, it's a great, great tool, and it, and it definitely will help take away from the intimidation factor. Because fishing, a lot of times on a new body of water, is intimidating. And by having an app to sort of give you guys a starting point where you need to go, um, you can go some places where you know there's fish at, and then you can duplicate that, you know, with your own, you know, spin on it. For sure. It, it's, and that's exactly what Randy said here. It's, it gives you a starting point. It, gives, it gets you to, hey, here's a couple of ideas of where to go with your day versus – go fish here, cast right here with this exact bait, this situation. Like there's still so much, even like we could say, go throw an Alabama rig down the bank. You have to have the right retrieve on it. You have to pay attention. Is the wind actually blowing in on the bank or what's happening there? Um, you know, what are the conditions? There's still so many things you have to observe and understand in fishing. So this is not the, uh, go here, catch, cast, catch fish immediately. But one really cool comment I did see from Chad, he said, I fished for hours and had no bite. I had a buzz bait as an option. So I tried it and caught a three and a two pounder. I would have never thrown a buzz bait in December. And that's the cool stuff. Like sometimes, uh, you know, what I did with all the patterns and the way I under or I developed the algorithm was I took real tournament patterns and that buzzbait in uh, December, that's a really good 
big fish pattern that a lot of guys don't know about, but it's from tournaments. Turn that's like a tournament pattern that I collected that data, and you know we're teaching this algorithm how to predict what potentially could happen, and so that's what we're trying to do. So it's just aggregating knowledge. It's kind of like um, if you think about a uh, football plays. If you have everyone has the playbooks, they know what type of plays are good. They kind of have all this information out there. They know what the wind conditions are, all this stuff. But you still have to pick the right play at the right time to beat the competition, and that's kind of how this is. It's like a, it's a playbook with all the info there for you, but you still have to pick the right play. Bill Belichick's going to pick the right play more times than not versus just some random guy who goes in there and has Bill's playbook. That's kind of how I think about it. Anyways, good deal. So uh, everyone's saying that you're going to have. Uh, an app, Randy, and then the live scope, and then the yeah. Alabama ring. So you're gonna have it all. Uh, that would be uh, that would be a sight to see, Randy. I might get you out in the boat one day, Randy. All teched out. We uh, might. Maybe, that might yeah, be the most mad the Randy scope. ever will be. <laughs> what was that, Randy? I said I said maybe the app, but not the live scope. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Would you think the app is legal in tournaments, Randy? I, we haven't even. I haven't even thought about that. I didn't really think about yeah, you know, as long as it's public information, if it's accessible to the public, it's going to be legal. So, it's, so now yeah, people will be able to use it to scout for tournaments. That's awesome. Cool. That's a good deal. Well, I am glad that you like it, Randy, and I'm glad that some of the guys who are here are enjoying it. Um, definitely something that we're going to be working on. And again, I've not been fishing in like three weeks because of that so once i get uh the app finished i'll be back to fishing i'll be making more uh good content i have a couple videos coming up here guys that i filmed in november so you'll see a little bit of a delay i had to kind of spread out the content a little bit more than i normally would i like to keep it as relevant as possible but just because the app i had to kind of spread it out i do have a video coming up randy that i think you would really enjoy i went to grand lake and i caught him on a spinner bait by the sailboat bridge area in dirty water I, I went full Randy on him. Oh, so. man, I can't wait to see that. <laughs> It'll be a good one. I had no live scope on the boat either, so no live scope. My live scope was off the boat. Uh, I was switching stuff around, and I had to catch him in two foot of water on a spinnerbait, so that was a pretty fun one. Man, I think the last time you did that, when you were about 12 years old, wasn't it, when you fished like that? Yeah, it, it threw me off, too. I didn't. Uh, I, I feel like I didn't know what I was doing, and you'll see that in my uh, my results. I caught some good ones, but... I, uh, my lack of experience of shallow over the past 10 years was definitely glaring. Uh, I got up, I got pretty close, but, uh, uh, if I, if you were in the boat with me, we probably would have hammered them. Um, but I caught some pretty good ones. So it's a good one. So anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this live stream. Again, leave a comment after this video posts about your opinions about the live scope. Uh, put it in the comments. And also, if you're still here, there's 200 people. Leave a like on the video. If you thumbs up the video, leave a like. really helps us out. And also, if you leave a comment, it helps us out with the YouTube algorithm. It just gets it out, the video out to more people. More people will be here. And also, subscribe to the Fish Moment live stream channel. A lot of you guys are subscribed over on Randy's channel, on my channel. There's only 9,000 subscribers here on this Fish to Moment channel. It'd be awesome if we got up to 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So if you're here, just go hit that subscribe button. It would really help us out. Uh, anyways, Randy, hopefully we're going to get back on the lake soon, catch some fish. It's going to get colder here, and we're going to be hammering on a jerk bait. So uh, anything else to share before we sign off? Yeah, just one final thing, guys. Just uh, you know, just be good to yourself. I mean, fishing is the toughest sport that there is out there to learn. So, if you guys, you know, it doesn't matter what your skill levels are. If you're starting out and you get frustrated at it, just realize that we all get frustrated. That's just part of it, and just uh, realize that uh, it, it's just the toughest sport there is. It's a, it's, it's a tremendously rewarding sport, but we all struggle from time to time at it. For sure. And one last thing. Thanks for the 10 euro super chat from Angling Mailbox. He says that underwater swimming pool tests is probably uh, the most important aspect of fishing, seeing the baits live underwater versus live scope or Alabama rig or anything else. Um, he thinks that over the long run, underwater swimming pool tests are, are going to be awesome. And I, I agree. I love my underwater videos. You guys like my underwater pool tests. Um, I don't do as many of those videos. I know that... Um, Tactical Bassin, Dave Dudley, other guys do those tests, and I think they're really cool. Um, I, I tune in to watch them. 
I get more uh, geeked out about where the fish are, how to find them versus the baits because you have to find the fish to catch the fish. That's, in my opinion, the best way to go about it. I'll figure out the baits and stuff after that, but if I can get really good at finding them, if you're not fishing around the fish, it doesn't matter if you have the best bait and the best to retrieve and the best way to cast it. If you're not around any fish, it doesn't really matter. So that's kind of my uh, my approach to it, but there's always a lot of ways to approach a problem. And so um, thanks for a super chat, and thanks to everyone who's, who's on tonight. Uh, and we will see you guys next week, same right. time, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And that'll be our last live stream of the – year because we're going to have Christmas and New Year's and all that stuff so we're probably going to just take a little bit of time for family and for holidays and so we'll see you guys for our last live stream of the year next week. Thanks to Randy for joining me and we'll see you all next week.